Welcome to Embracing the Bold Radio Hour, where we explore the vibrant arts, entertainment, and design scene right here at Valencia College. Join us as we chat with students, faculty, and artists about their journeys, inspirations, and professional experiences. Each episode unveils the creative pulse of our campus, offering insights into the world of artistry and education. Let's delve into the heart of creativity together right here on Embracing the Bold. We're so glad you joined us today, and I'm your host, Rebecca Lane. All right, welcome, and thank you for joining us on Embracing the Bold. Today, we are talking about the uh, Selected Fine Arts faculty show that is currently in the Anita Wooten Gallery on the East Campus, and it plays all the way through when? December 8th. So this show is available through December 8th, so you have through the end of the fall semester to check that out. And uh, we have a couple of artists with us here today. Before we make those introductions, I just want to plug the rest of our season. Right now, we are in Thanksgiving break, and I hope you're having a fantastic Thanksgiving break. Uh, Other events that are happening is the music department is putting on the music department holiday show. That's on Tuesday, November 1st. That's this evening. Uh, We are recording this on Tuesday, November 1st. When we come back, we've got Mary Navidad. That is Thursday, November 30th. It's at the Osceola campus, Building One, Room 101. That's the auditorium. And that is a play that is by Professor Juan Viegas Berrios. Uh, We are also featuring on November 30th, the Fall Opera Theater Workshop Show, workshop performance. That is at 7.30 in the East Campus Performing Arts Center. The show they are doing is How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. And those those two shows on November 30th close out our fall semester. So since we have art faculty here today, let's go a little more deeply into the art show. So um, let's everybody introduce yourselves. Let me know who you are, what's your name, what you teach, or what you do or teach here at Valencia, and what is featured, what of your work is featured in the current show. And let's start with Farron. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Well, my name's Farron Lejeune. I'm the interim gallery director here. I actually do not teach at the moment, so I just get to focus on gallery work, and my work is not featured in the show, so I don't have much more to add on that at the moment. But you did. Did you do a level of curation? Um, yeah, I did curate the show. I guess I wasn't thinking about that as being my work, so <laughs> interesting. That's another way to look at that. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. And Kyle. Yeah. Um, thank you, Farron. Um, thank you for the, the curation of the show. It's beautiful. Um, I celebrate your inaugural exhibition. The lighting, labels, placement of the art. It is an art form, and you did a beautiful job. Congratulations. Well, thank Thanks yeah, a lot. Nice job. Um, I'm, I'm an artist and a teacher. I'm Kyle. I teach design and drawing uh, at Valencia campus, east and west. Um, I'm Courtney Canova. I teach drawing and design at East uh, Valencia campus and also work as a muralist and photographer. Um, I wanted to be an illustrator when I grew up, so I've this is I've been gigging ever since. <laughs> and are you? I think you said this. Are you primarily on East, Courtney? Yes, primarily on East. Awesome. So, uh, can you give me a, a sense for what what we can see in the faculty show? Um, can we share pictures, or is it? What? So you can send me pictures, and that can be on the YouTube channel. But um, right now we are just on the radio. Okay. <laughs> Let me describe this artwork. I pass it to my kids for, they're always like, well, I want to tell you what it's like. If you could tell me, then we wouldn't need pictures. So <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I'll send you a picture. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm working on uh, the, uh, I mean, the, actually the, the piece that I have in the show is something I'm in the middle of getting approved in the land. It's a, a small mural that'll be in the historic downtown section and it's a woman that grew up in town she's a women's health advocate that's nationally known 
Um, so we were in, she, she didn't have much recognition in Deland at all. So we're um, I, I painted a, uh, a, uh, I painted her into the personality of a, an old tree with, that's branched out um, a lot more flowery language, but um, that's the, that's the, she's from Deland and it, it, I paint a lot of historical murals around downtown Deland. I had just been requested by people that grew up with the, the murals in downtown Deland that they wanted something that was different than the stodgy old murals that had been painted in the past. So that was that's that was my goal. That was the creative goal for this piece. Um, so I'm actually in the middle of it. So I actually have like the Photoshop. Um, I painted a three by three rough draft of it, and then I have a. Uh, um, a uh, Photoshop version of it on the wall because I found that in presentations people say they have imaginations but they don't. So this shows exactly what it looks like when it's finished painting. And then uh, I also have the the little plaque that goes by describing Billy Avery, the uh, the portrait that it's being done of. So that's that's a current piece, and it's mostly feeds back to the way I'm teaching in class is that I don't have a body of work. I usually work by commission. So a lot of working by commission is communicating your final pieces to the client before they're done because you're, you know, um, it's like going to a restaurant. You pick, you pick off a menu, what you want, and then they create it. And then, you know, I like being paid for pieces before I do them and not have an inventory of work that I'm hoping to sell as a commodity. So that's that's been my business model for a while. Um, yeah, so I, I teach it. I try to teach the class as a business too, if I can, as much as just encouraging them to draw and be be positive about it. Um, the, well, you don't, you know, drawing one doesn't require a portfolio to get in. It's a drawing one level, college level class, and that's. One of the things I always brag about working at Valencia is I've, I've admired all my colleagues. I respect them. Sometimes wonder how they let me in. So <laughs> they really, it's a, it's a really amazing group of professors to work with. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway. Yeah, that that that's, sounds great, Courtney. So it sounds yeah. like within the gallery show, you have you have one painting that is a, yep. a preview for a mural that you're hoping to have in Deland. It just got approved while it was hanging in the, in the gallery. It got approved by the, the mural committee approval board in Deland, and now it's going in front of the historical board, but it will probably pass right through. But yeah, it'll, and I should paint it over uh, December break. Oh, that's Deland. great. Yeah. And, and yeah. Kyle, what do you have in the gallery show? Um, can I just ask Courtney one thing? Oh, please do. Um, did you get paid for the mock-up, the painting? Yeah, yeah, I got. Yeah, I I found that I would have only done one mural in Deland if I didn't get paid. It was, it was way, way too much work. I and I get. I usually ask for ten percent of the total price for the mock-up if I was working with people I haven't worked all the time with, and then uh, uh, I, I roughly figure out the size of the mural and kind of do a square foot ballpark it. So I, you know, make sure I'm, you know, I compare it to, the yeah, compare, compare it to nice wallpaper, <laughs> you know, so that you sell, you buy that by the square foot. Awesome. I, I was just wondering where that painting come, came from. And that makes sense. It came from outside of you. It's a commission. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. But it came from also listening to Billy. I, I went to, I, I was really struggling for an idea, but I went and listened to her talk and during her talk about herself she, this was the images she was verbally describing of being a, a young lady sitting in an oak tree and imagining the future and i was like thank you <laughs> well done um i did an installation piece that was um i i didn't want to plan i wanted to do something that was impromptu and um reactionary um, so it started with this ship that I, um, I wanted to put into a piece of art, a found ship. 
and old fashioned 17th, 18th century, you know, with the sails. Um, it's, so it kind of started with the fetish, my installation. Then I added a piece to work with the ship that is a man with a sled pulled by dogs. It's a little wall hanging sconce piece from um, a Transformer robot series that I did. And the Transformer robot series was about um, displaced entities, um, people from another planet or cyber organisms from another planet that have to look for a new place to live. And instead of hiding as a fast, cool car, what if they were more open to, I don't know, culture? <laughs> so um, I, I made a whole bunch of uh, constructions and um, wall sconces and um, pedestal pieces assemblage art um, that have transformer pieces in them, transformer robots and Power Ranger, um, Power Rangers and Legos. Then um, spilling off of that is a little um, collection of objects like a campsite, like a derelict campsite, which I just thought oh, those three worked together. It was like from the glorious ship um, going out to explore and change the world and come back with treasures to this guy reduced to a sled with parts and pieces of his ship on the sled till finally there's nothing left but the parts and pieces from the sled that he's using for a fire and he's made his own like little shower so it turns into this displacement piece and then I, I stayed with that theme I had <laughs> the whole thing is made from objects from previous bodies so there's a painting of a lady on the other side of the installation who's, um, it's an image from a magazine. She's behind a fence and her house is completely destroyed. I added to that um, all the little objects, um, all the surviving objects from her destruction, from her loss are in like little shipping containers, little boxes. And I made those boxes for when we were in the pandemic and we were in Zoom. So I wanted my students to see how they could create a little still life of bob, uh, boxes and, and tubes, um, bottles and bowls um, that they could work from home on. And I made a whole bunch of that stuff. So it just became a, a, an easy added element to that painting of the lady behind the fence with her house destroyed. So I like working two dimensionally and three dimensionally. I'm a storyteller. Um, and then I added to this on her side, I added her dream house above her as a little wall mounted, almost like a cuckoo clock up there. Just a very pretty little perfect house. And then between those two, um, three on one side, three on the other, is a painting that I did for the show made from found, uh, uh, found images and painting. Um, where it's kind of like the thing, the image that unifies the whole installation. And the whole thing is a risk because I didn't see it all together until we put it in the show and put it together. Everything was in progress and the painting was the last thing to get done. So I didn't know if it would work or not. And um, I like taking that risk. I think it's an important part of being an artist. Um, and then I just bring my philosophy into the classroom. I, I teach technique, I teach the basics, and it's, it's so fun to do that because you're the beginning for them with their education. Um, their experience with you is kind of like you can set the tone for what they do and where they go. You can change a scientist to an artist right there in your design class. Um, so I introduce the magic of art, creating the illusion of three dimensions on a two dimensional plane in design and in drawing, it's more about technique. It's not so conceptual um, because you, you have to know the techniques in order to break the rules. You have to know what the rules are. So we get our students ready for UCF. They go on there and they, and they go further and further with their drawing. But when they go there, they're ready. They've been trained um, in both drawing and design. So it's really fun to be a part of that. I, I love teaching. I love being around that kind of 
beauty and intelligence and talent, it's just amazing. Students know they're good. They just don't know how good they actually are. Oh, I totally and agree. So, so, cause I want to get into this, but I wanted to do a little more conversation about what we actually see if we go visit the gallery. So, so we've got two of our artists here today, Kyle and Courtney, and then we also have Farron who curated it. And we've heard a little bit about Courtney's painting. We've heard a little bit about uh, the installation that Kyle's developed. So Farron, can you tell me a little bit more about what we might see if we go visit the faculty show? Um, well, I think it's interesting what they've been talking about because um, they've both been talking about interactions with students mm -hmm. and teaching because the gallery is a teaching gallery. Ultimately, it's on campus. And um, if you go to the exhibition now, you're actually going to see a variety of different uh, modalities of art making and different types of materials. Um, and it's going to be across all, well, all of our art teaching campuses. So not just East Campus faculty, but also faculty from West Campus and I think downtown and Osceola. Mm -hmm. uh, we have sculpture, ceramics, photography, painting, um, multimedia constructions, uh, even more traditional portraiture, mm -hmm. which is also ceramic with, you know, sculpture. So I'm not sure there's a whole lot that's left out in terms of what a student could do. I mean, the possibilities are endless, of course, but I, I think a lot of the bases are covered with, uh, with the show. So with the show, we could see traditional portraiture. We can see, uh, what we might think of when we think of fine art, um, portrait sculptures, busts, stuff like that. But mm -hmm. then we're also seeing some more modern art. We're seeing some uh, installation work, found object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, Andrew Downey has um, watercolors, which even from his own description is almost, you know, reminiscent of uh, explorers in a new continent that are. Um, just kind of documenting what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the front wall, we have Dennis Angel's piece, which is very, a very strong linkage to tradition with a homage to Vermeer on the front. And it's a very, uh, well, I think there's a contemporary twist on it, but his depiction is um, very much in line with some conservative ideals about, about things. But it's very colorful. And then, you know, you walk inside and you see the, the Vejiganti mask from um, Chelsea Glidden, who is, I think, from uh, Osceola. I could be wrong. I might have forgotten about something. Um, and um, yeah, we've got busts in there from David Cumby. We've got some figurative work from Michael Galetta, uh, which is sculpture, although not like traditional sculptural materials. I believe he used some foam and some ceramic coating on the outside. Mm -hmm. So a bit of a modern twist on a, a bit of an older tradition. Okay. And then, uh, of course, photography from Cassandra Anselmo and Alan Maxwell. And, um, well, we've heard about Courtney Canova's painting, which is a mock-up for a mural, which is a much more, well, it's a more modern idea. And Kyle's installation piece and... And then um, some very nice drawings, a selection of drawings from Victoria McGrath. So I think there's plenty to see. There if is. If you go in. So what's, what's the value in this? So this, it sounds like this, uh, there's a lot of variety that you're going to see if you come. Um, so what, what is the value uh, to students in coming to see this hod, well, I'm gonna call it hodgepodge, but I don't, I don't think that's really the right word, but I'm gonna say this, this hodgepodge collection, what's the value as a student to come and see uh, this collection? I mean, I would say you get to see a lot of different possibilities of where you could go with your future as an artist. I mean, I think it's good to see traditional art forms. It's also good to see things that are a bit more, I don't know if avant-garde would be the right term to use because it's a little bit specific, but you know, something, being able to branch out and do anything Okay, and Courtney and Kyle, like what, what do you have to add to that? As a student, what is the value in coming to see this particular faculty show? 
<laughs> I'm always trying to get a read on that. <laughs> You're trying Wait, to get a read what? on that? You're like, yeah. I don't know. Why should we come? <laughs> I mean, well, I I have a lot of, I love doing it. But for my students, I, 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 I feel like it would be, it's, I always feel like it would be great for them to see what I'm doing so that, for me as a student, if I felt like you were better than me, um, that helped. I will listen to you. Um, mm. And I just want to, you know, I would want to know how good my professor is, what they make, what 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 are they interested in. I I I I hope that that's what my students are looking for when they come in. Um, they don't really say; um, they kind of keep it to themselves. But for me, the motivation in doing the show is it's a great chance to be with my peers um, and to do something new, to do something experimental, and also to photograph something that's new in a gallery setting. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to do the faculty show. I, I really enjoy it. I, I don't think I've ever missed one. <laughs> and I try to also surprise everybody. Like, I want to surprise my peers. I do it for my peers as much. I really love what you're saying about that, Kyle. Like, so I know that we're, we're a school, we're focused on um, very much the education of the students and adding that value. But I really love how you connected this to the, to the faculty and art community uh, on the professional level. Like the joy, the joy in getting to go say, oh, hey, this is what I'm doing right now. Yeah. I I want to freak you out. I want I want to do something so good that you get you go home and copy me. You know, and and I'm going to copy you. I warn you. I come as a thief. <laughs> I like Kyle's work's always very detailed. I, you brought in a set of paintings one year, and it was like, okay, that's crazy intimidating. I, the younger me had the patience to do this. The older me is like, you're crazy. <laughs> you know, but yeah, they're they were great pieces. You have to be still to paint a piece that takes a year. Mm. Yeah. But, oh. but otherwise, <laughs> you know, my sister thinks I can't play dead. I, and she's right. I, I can't stop moving unless I'm painting. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah. Well, and then I, like I took my, it, when I need a key to the gallery so I can take my nighttime classes in there. But the, uh, I love, I took my drawing class through the, the gallery just to kind of show them because they had those charcoal pieces in there, the highly rendered charcoal pieces that are, you know, it's like, this is the same materials you're using now, charcoal. This is where you can go with it, you know. And Valencia is still a traditional school. It's still the art, the, the teaching at Valencia is not conceptual. It's still a lot of the practical traditional art. I think a lot of, I was listening to a student or a recent graduate coming in and talking about a lot of the art schools have gone to conceptual. And um, that Valencia, when you're learning to be a sculptor, you're not learning to be a traditional sculpt or a conceptual sculpt sculpture. You're actually learning to make molds, throw uh, plaster forms, printmaking from, you know, the 15th century. <laughs> it was like, you know, you're learning traditional art, which and yeah. all my all my colleagues are masters at it. So it's makes it for a lot of fun. I, I mean, I've heard that like, um, I went to Ringling, so and I've heard that Ringling only accepts like two two art schools in the state, and Valencia is one of them. So it's a it's a good school. And what I always push out of me is like the marketing for Valencia is always it's cheap. It's like no, it's really good. It's better than the average. Well, better than the Orlando most of the art schools in Orlando. So it's. Um, it's just the marketing. I came out of a marketing. I worked in advertising agencies to support my illustration habit <laughs> growing up. So it, I, I, I got, I got really cynical towards marketing. So when Kyle's like, <laughs> I'm like, I like painting other people's ideas because it's like, wow, my ideas are so cynical. <laughs> I'm still working at trying to paint work on my own. As I'm getting older and wanting to paint my own story, I'm like, wow, I gotta dial back my art. It's <laughs> always a challenge. I know. I, that's what I really admired about just artists that you tell be, their own stories. You can be a really good artist and very successful, um, but that can be elusive. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's like I've been, when I trained myself as being an illustrator, it was exactly for doing like what I did with Billy. It's like I studied the person and I wait till they listen to them. And then the idea will click in your head. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what I want to do. And then I kind of make it my own, but the inspiration came from outside of me, like what you're saying. And it, it's, it's, it's like inspirations that come from inside of me. I'm always like, mm, do I, I don't know. <laughs> I have friends that go, when I talk about inspirations from inside of me, they're always like, you don't want to sell anything, do you? <laughs> like, okay, I'm going, to do com- I'm going to do commission work. <laughs> yeah, I do want to be able to make a living out. And freedom, I mean, that's the other thing is making, you know, when you make a living as an artist, you're, you know, it's freedom <laughs> it's to do your own stuff if you can. So, you know, I don't want to teach it as a hobby. <laughs> Got it. Well, and so what... Yeah. So what was your, so, so we've got this show and the show is really kind of indicative of where you, where you both are in your craft right now. And it's indicative of where, what you are hoping to show your peers and, yeah, yeah. and we bring in our students to kind of see not just what our faculty are doing, but hopefully to give them inspiration, uh, hopefully to set a level of, um, understanding this is what I, I know that I know that we're teaching you basic drawing right now but like this is what our faculty can do so it's a level of this is what is beyond what you're learning in class um, but each of those is like part of your journey right so where where did you guys start and and whoever wants to go first how did you find how did you find fine art as a I don't know as a passion as a career I'm not sure what the right question is. How did you find it? And Farron, this includes you too. Well, I might go ahead and jump in on this because I was going to make some comments on what they had been saying about students because I I was a student here. This is where I started my journey in the fine arts. No way. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, I think off. Kyle is right that um, I feel kind of, to borrow Canova's word, cynical for saying this, but yeah, when I was a student, I definitely was judging my professors. <laughs> and a lot of it might have been because, again, with what he said, I actually came from the STEM field and I changed to the fine arts. And I kind of made a decision to do that before I entered the fine arts officially. I was kind of in between doing that or music because I had decided that I didn't want to continue with the medical path that I was on. And um, so I was already kind of committed. If anything, I might have chosen music instead, but I don't think I was going to go back to medical. And um, and so because <laughs> of that, I think I came in with a lot of arrogance because I was like, well, this is just the fine arts. This isn't a hard science or something. And I, I went through a pretty um, radical metamorphosis over the next few years. So, um, yeah, I was always apt to go to uh a faculty. Well, I mean, I, I wasn't as involved with the actual exhibitions on campus because I was very much focused on work. Like if there was an exhibition going on, I would go see it at a different time than the opening because I would have been working in the studios and I just didn't care. But that's <laughs> that's just my, my personality. I'd rather go when it's quieter, I think. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't always hungry, I guess, or I just didn't care about eating. Otherwise, I would have rushed off to get free food. Yeah, um, so I do. Yeah, um, so... Yeah, I think that is an important aspect of showing that um, that artwork. And I think there was something else that Courtney said that I was going to comment on, and now I've forgotten. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, that's what I get for staying quiet good too or, long and not saying good something. Good or bad? Or <laughs> no, no, it was good. I, I wasn't intending to uh, intending to argue with anybody. But um, oh, but okay. but yeah. So I started here. And then I went on to, oh, this is what I was going to say. I went on to UCF and um, because of what I wanted to do there, because, you know, I'm also an artist. I do sculpture. I've been on something of a hiatus for the past couple of years, for better or worse, but it's okay. Um, And I I went on there to do something like traditional sculpture. Not traditional conceptually, per se, but the materials. And uh, Valencia College definitely has a very strong traditional resource base that I was accustomed to and that totally changed when I went to UCF. In fact, um, Michael Galetta fired all of my undergraduate work or just about all of my undergraduate work out of the kindness of his heart because uh, I wasn't able to get access to kilns 
because I did a lot of ceramic See, sculpture. Professor um, Glenn made his work. Yeah. He did it. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I brought all the work that I made at UCF here, and he graciously fired it for me. Wait, Otherwise, so, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I'd love some clarification. So when you say uh, traditional versus conceptual, like what are you what are you referring to? I guess what I, I did a lot of um, my work is narrative and it's figurative, using the human figure. Okay. And I'm only making that distinction because I also did a philosophy minor there, and I met with them, and they're like, "What do you do?" And I said I was a figurative sculptor, and the philosophy professor looked at me like, "Well, what does that mean?" You know, like if I meant like figuratively, I am a sculptor. <laughs> and and I, had to, I had to clarify that for him. Well, and, and so clarify it for me, too, because I, I don't I, I come from the theater. <laughs> OK, well, uh, it's basically just very traditional to use the human form as a narrative vessel, especially okay. with a certain degree of realism. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be considered traditional, but that's the way that I was looked at when I joined the, the BFA program the person in charge of the sculpture program was like, well, just make it, make it contemporary or something like he was, he kind of turned his nose up at me about the fact that I wanted to use the human form. Okay. And, so and when we're talking about figurative, traditional sculpture, we're talking about, uh, sculpting the human form. Mm -hmm. Now, is that specifically referencing nudes or is that portraiture and busts? Like what is, there is a lot of nudes in my work. Most of that has to do with venerating the human form and cutting past some of those other aspects. Also, when I got started, uh, it's a little bit, I found it a little bit easier to focus on the human form without dealing with clothing or drapery. Yeah. To just kind of get to the root of the human structure. Okay. But, but all of it's really just kind of, it's, it's in a similar line as like Gian Lorenzo Bernini or Michelangelo. That's the reason why I say it's very strongly rooted in traditional sculptural forms. Okay. And so when you say it's narrative, like what is, what does that mean? So we've got somebody sitting in a chair, a sculpture of a, of a, a nude sitting in a chair. And now we make it narrative. What does that mean? Well, that's where the concept comes into play. I mean, even traditional sculpture was also conceptual, but um, oftentimes the forms I'm using are sometimes mythical Mythical, mythical uh, creatures like satyrs or, um, well, I guess there was a lot of that. Otherwise, it was generally like kind of traditional myth that I would try to put my own twist on. But Okay, so it's rooted in story. So we're taking mm -hmm. characters from story, mm -hmm. and then we are, we are realizing them within a sculpture. Mm -hmm. And perhaps from a moment, an emotional moment within that story. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool. What I was mostly interested in in terms of concept was um, some alchemical and Jungian symbolism. And I think in a lot of ways I was trying to put distortion on my own self-expression because I think as an artist you tend, it's impossible to not be self-expressing. And I think I saw <laughs> a lot of my peers really focusing on themselves like very heavily. And um, I, I didn't care for that, I guess. Uh, maybe maybe it's an, uh, my own personal problems or something. Like I don't want to focus on myself, even though I know that I am. So I felt like if I tried to distance myself from that, mm -hmm. then that was good. Maybe it wasn't. But, uh, but yeah, that's what I would consider the conceptual aspect of what I was doing. Is Do you identify yeah. with the figure you're making? Um, almost always. And it doesn't have to be just one if it's a multi-figure composition. Like I would, most every figure is some facet of what I'm experiencing that I'm trying to convey. Ooh. Nice. So, so it's like a, a reaching outside of yourself to reflect on what is happening inside. Yeah. I like to kind of think of it like expressing through a prism. Ooh. Yeah. Good. I like oh, it. Are all your, are most of your figures female? Uh, nope. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of male figures, actually, when I look back on that. I almost have to, it's almost kind of sad. I have to try to remember all of these things because I haven't been in my studio in a, in a little bit. But um, yeah, there's no, um, I don't think I, I had a really strong female focus, but there are definitely, there are probably more male figures than there are female, actually. 
Well, and just a note to listeners, it, it's very different to make your work than it is to talk about your work. It's almost like two completely different skill sets and habits. Like being able to craft something is very different from helping somebody who's not made it and also who's not seen it understand like what it is. So, I mean, I think you're doing a great job, Farron. Yeah. No. Well, thank you. <laughs> I want to Tell see me you're, you're keeping a sketchbook, right? Um, I, I've got I a do. lot of uh, disorganized sketchbooks just floating around. Excellent. Good. I had, I had some really big plans for when I graduated, and I wasn't accounting for the fact that I was going to get married right afterwards, too, and then start doing all these different things. And of course, wow. no one was prepared for 2020. <laughs> Not yeah. at all. No. Yeah. But I'm still hanging on. I'll, I'll figure it out. That's awesome. So I think you helped me understand. So when we're talking about Valencia College being a traditional training program, what that means is we are we are teaching those traditional values of what balance and structure and uh, good design, good design. And, and what does that mean? What does good design mean? <laughs> it's musical theory to music. It's taking a musical like I wanted to be a music major. I was like split between music major or art school. And uh, design class is like the music theory class to musicians. And if you're elements and either one, yeah, yeah, elements and principles. And and they apply to all the art forms. We're we're all using the same elements and principles. Oh, so yeah. we introduce students to those elements and principles. If you, well, you've been using them all along, but you didn't know what they were. So um, you were naive. You were primitive. Once you become an academic, you can't claim to be. A primitive artist anymore you can literally manipulate those elements and principles to create the thing you're trying to create to create the environment or the mood or the expression that you want to create you can knowingly use those things or abuse them but you have to know them to use them and, <laughs> and also if you're if you're you could do all of our assignments on a computer but if you do then you haven't solved any problems technology solved all the problems for you so in our like in my classroom month i tell them you're like tony stark um, iron man without the suit you have to rely on your own manual abilities and your own intelligence to solve this problem tech can't help you you don't have Ooh. the suit well and i i say the same thing it's like uh, uh, technology if you're heading for a job where you push the buttons you're heading for a minimum wage job. You, you got to think, you know, this design is something that um, you need to think through. Uh, and if you're, yeah, that's kind of what you're saying, right? Kyle? And going to technology, you need to know those things and able to, in order yeah. to be better, you know, to rise up and be that person who really is more successful than the other designers and gamers around you. you know, I was coming up through the field in, in, when Photoshop was coming up through and Illustrator, and I know that a lot of people, a lot of the business guys that I was working with would hire an IT guy to go and start creating the ads. I was like, you can, you, knowing the program and how to turn it on does not make you a designer. No. It was, you know, and then like when I was at uh, one of the trip, what was it? One of the national companies in Lake Mary, uh, they were trying to come up with a, a a uh, program that would design the ads automatically. And I was like, you know, it'd be easier to design the management program than it would be to design the, the design, the, the ad, anyway. Well, well, so Courtney, <laughs> tell me, I want to know a little bit more about your journey. So we know, Mine? we know about Farron's journey. So what about yours? How did you, how did you discover fine art and, and what me? brought you here? Yes, you. <laughs> oh, I'm still trying to discover fine art. I, I'm, I'm still... <laughs> I thought that was plain. <laughs> I, 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 I was a graphic designer to support my illustration habit. I was an illustration major coming out of Ringling and then uh, uh, was getting so tired of cut and paste and waxing down and cameras. And I, I uh, um, would take illustration habits along, take illustration jobs along the way. I kept sketchbooks and I drew all the time. Um, but I only supported myself for about a year with illustration around here. Should have gone to New York, like my teacher said to do, but I stayed in Florida. 
families here it's, it's yeah. a big draw it's kind of like coming out of school and i got married <laughs> and um so along the way i uh i worked in advertising agencies i i i learned photoshop illustrator and i kind of don't say this too loud at Valencia, but I'm like one of the best Photoshop artists there. I'm just, I would drive me crazy to teach it. I, I, my traditional skills fed right into my computer skills that made me like what Kyle's saying, you know, made, made me formidable in the computer field as mm -hmm. far as design goes and, and illustration and drawing. We put, you have to be able to draw now to on your computers. It doesn't do it for you. So I, I, um, <laughs> I worked at big corporate, I worked at a big corporation you know, it's like I discovered I was the worst boss I've ever had. No, no time <laughs> off, no health benefits, you know, and I worked for a big corporation. You get institutionalized and it, it and then uh, um, got that as the, I don't know, I have this better thought out when I have it outlined, but, you know, I, I we got in 2008, I wanted to start doing murals through the towns like I had done in Deland. And then I, uh, 2009 the economy crashed and tragedies happened and I just my wife came home with it and said okay we're going to be wedding photographers so I I'm really good in photoshop so I I started we started uh shooting like everybody you know even though the economy is down this people still bought weddings so I did weddings and um started teaching at Valencia and uh, we we stayed really busy we made you know, most years, um, my what I make at Valencia pays my taxes. Some years don't, but you know that's my humble brag. It's like, oh yeah, it's, you know. But you know, it's like what I want to tell the students that, you know, looking for a licensed field, you know, then good for fair and be smart enough to actually look at doing the medical field. Being an artist was my third choice. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't smart enough to look at the medical field. The, uh, <laughs> Wait, so, so, so why'd you end up at Ringling? Because it sounds like, so oh, you, you graduated from Ringling I, as, as an illustrator, and then you yeah, went really yeah. quickly into graphic design after you worked for yourself for a year. And then you ended up yeah. doing marketing for corporate. But then you also I, I, were doing I, like I, wedding photography. But like, how did you, how did you find Ringling in the first place? So, I looked at Stetson. I grew up in New Smyrna, and I looked at Stetson to be music, and and I looked at musicians, and I, I was playing the bass, like hanging on the wall back there. I was playing the bass, but you know nobody was asking me to come play the bass for me. But they did ask me to come draw for them. So I was like, <laughs> I. I'm probably a better artist than I am a musician. I think I'm going to, you know, I have more passion with two-dimensional stuff than I do um, music. So music. Wait, so were you, my were you like taking art classes in high school? I, I was kind of the, no, I took one. <laughs> 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 but my dad drew. Okay, my dad drew. He was an artist. He sketched all the time. Okay. I grew up around it. I, I had it in the home. So I was familiar with it. And when I would do the high school classes, I was a little bit annoyed. <laughs> so I was, sorry. It, but it, you know, I, an artist, you know, it's like the artists I have in my classes, the really good ones are terrible students. <laughs> you know, but I don't know. That's kind of, it's, that's another subject. Um, but yeah, they, they um, yeah, I think artists are a little bit rebellious when they're, you know, they're trying to say things. They're, so that's what I, yeah. Um, I, so I went to, I, so I had two choices. I wasn't smart enough to go to medical or engineering or anything like that. It was like, okay, art school. <laughs> so I went off to Ringling and about the, about the second year in my, my classes at Ringling, I realized this is my tribe. This is, mm -hmm. these are my people. This is the language I've always spoke. It was, it was a real epiphany. It was like, oh, I have, I have to be an artist. So I mean, it's, it, it wasn't it, just about loving to draw. It was as no. much about like, these are, these are the people who, who I find enriching yeah. and who feed my yeah. soul. This is how I tell my stories. This is the way mm. I think it was, it was like, Oh, Oh, I, I, that's why I couldn't sign up for anything else. This is all I, this is me. And I, and I tell my students, it's like, you know, being an artist, you know, it's like a servant to a vicious maiden. She, 
you have to pay attention to her. If you do anything else, you are not, you're not going to make a living at it. You have to, you know, it's, it's a dedicated profession. It's not a hobby. So that's, you know, and I'm, yeah. Well said. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> there, there are times when I, if I had a real estate license, I would have sold houses. <laughs> so. But, yeah. and yet, and yet you are making your living. Yeah. With, yeah. with your fine art skill. Yeah. And I, a lot of it's like, you know, closer, well, photography. I, I also, my, t I had a teacher that in Ringling, and he said, in my career, I've been a uh, director of magazines, been a paste-up artist been, at the time, uh, been a photographer. He said, uh, worked as a director for videos, you know, said everything has been in the creative field. It's like the field, I've been able, he's been able to have multiple midlife crises and change what he was doing within the field. He mm. said, so when you're learning, learn, learn what you can, you know, and I had photography. I have, I didn't I didn't like photographers that I met because I was an illustrator and serious, and they were you know oh I took this picture I'm like oh god you clicked again <laughs> so anyway when my wife said we're going to be photographers I'm like okay <laughs> I can be your Photoshop guy it, you know I can and, but that's what I loved about Photoshop is now I can manipulate images and it's realistic and and so um, I, I'm just stayed within the art field i would love to be like the fine artist that's you know museums are begging me to come to but I, i'm not that guy yet but i so that's what i think of as fine art i i make my living as collect you know, doing commissions um teaching at valencia uh, photography with my wife doing i have i tried to load up my quiver of job skills as much as i could when i was in school so that's and I've stayed within that realm. And That's great. So you've you've kind of diversified your income. Yeah. With, oh yeah. With a number of yeah. different it's things. Very important. Yeah. 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 It is. Or you and can. What is it? Duchamp always married well. He married rich girls a couple times. <laughs> so that was a good plan. <laughs> 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 Well, um, and I, I want to talk to Kyle too. We've got a little more than ten minutes. So Kyle, what was your journey? Um, my mom taught me how to draw. She could draw. And I always wanted to draw whatever she was drawing. So um, then when I went to school at Seminole, Seminole State College, um, I had, I met my wizard and he gave me a scholarship without even seeing my work. Um, he, he had a student disappointing him and, and he told me, I know you won't disappoint me. And I I was very determined not to disappoint oh. him. Um, he introduced me to the idea. All of his assignments were concept. Uh, he introduced us to the elements and principles through ideas. So when you're making a, a mostly three dimensional work, you're not thinking art, you're just thinking problem solving. And I've just kept doing that. I've just stayed with that. I love found images and I love found objects and I love telling stories. Um, and I just kept going with it. Um, so I've, I've stayed an artist. That's um, amazing. I, did you, did you stay in Florida for your training, Kyle, or did you? Um, through my bachelor's and then, um, I was already having a lot of success with festivals and selling and, um, I didn't want to go further, but, um, people I trusted encouraged me to go further and get a master. So I kind of like prayed about it and only pursued one school and sort of like left that as a fleece. If I get a scholarship, I'll go. And I did to university of Cincinnati. Oh, wow. And wow. it was tough. <laughs> <laughs> did it, did it affect how you made art? Uh, yes. Uh, I grew a lot. I, up until then, I got away with shaking my head yes and smiling and going on ahead and doing it my own way. Um, that didn't work in a graduate program. They, they just hold your feet to the fire until you cry, and they're not going to quit until you are crushed. Oh, that's that's that was the education I went through, and so 
um, it was good. I survived it. It was like a snake bite. You know, if you survive it, you're going to be stronger. Um, and uh, I came back to Florida because it just is where it opened up for me to go, to come back to Florida. And um, I've just kept making and creating and producing and showing. Um, and I also landed a job that helped me to make it through a lot of my career. I became the artist in residence at the Maitland Art Center. Ooh. Um, I had a, a reputation of being able to build stuff. When I was at Seminole, um, I got carpentry jobs from professors because I could do carpentry work. And um, that's finally gone away. I still get asked, but I can't say yes to that stuff anymore. Like you were saying, Courtney, you have to choose. You know, one or the other is going to suffer. You can't be both. Um, but the art center I got hired um, primarily because I could restore and renovate those ruins, <laughs> keep all those. Oh, paints. nice job. Nice. And um, so I lived there for a very long time. Uh, um, and it gave me a chance to be an artist and be a part of the art scene and a part of behind the art scene. Mm. Hang shows and meeting artists. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. And um, so I've moved on from there. I own my own house. It's so wonderful. I have a studio here inside and outside. I do the toxic, nasty, dangerous stuff outside and the cleaner things, smaller things inside. And I just keep showing and teaching. And um, teaching became a bigger thing. I had ar I was already teaching when I was at the Maitland Art Center, but it became my primary income once I left the art center. Even though I'm a successful artist, um, I, st I still have to do something. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Teaching is, I love it. And um, so I, I teach and I show. That's great. Well, I've been listening. What I'm loving about this conversation, I've been listening to um, uh, an artist named Andrew Simonet, and he uh, began as a choreographer, had his own dance company, and now he's a fiction writer. But but in the meantime, he created this uh, body of work that is all about making your life as an artist. So like, and and he's defining art very broadly and many many disciplines, right? But like how how to make your life as an artist. And one of the things he talks about is uh, diversifying income. He talks about that question of, if I'm not making a living from my art, am I still an artist? Um, like, well, <laughs> right. Well, and, and how, do you, how, do you, how do you subsidize the work? And sometimes we do commissions and the commission pays for the work. And sometimes we work at Publix and Publix pays for the work. And then hopefully somebody will pay for the work, but it's all like, like where, where is the balance? And, and what is that cycle? And maybe, maybe that means staying in the art field, but going into arts administration, or maybe that means, uh, or like going into marketing, like you were doing Courtney. And sometimes that means uh, artist residencies. Sometimes that means teaching. And yet, like what I'm, I'm loving about this conversation is no matter what, each of you are talking about, this is how I come back to practice. Like this is, and this is where I come back to make a thing. Yeah, I have a wife that keeps like, um, we have a little studio downtown Deland that we've done photography in one room, this room for, and then the next room over is like a little painting studio for me. Um, acrylics, but yeah, my wife definitely pushes me to stay, keep my hand on brushes. I've wanted to go electronic and just draw electronically because then I could make my studio look like the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> you know, so, you know, clean, smell free. So what, what would you, what would you say to, to student artists, like students who are just starting out, like what is your advice getting into this this field i feel like they're looking for permission hmm. and um and they just need to be encouraged 
but they really don't realize how good they are. And, and the biggest thing is just showing up, just try. I give a lot of extra credit for outside the classroom activities. It doesn't matter how good a teacher you may be. It doesn't matter how good a teacher I may be. Where a student's really going to learn is out there in the real world. Take a risk. It's not about success. It's about taking the risk. I so love that. I, I tell them that and, um, and I tell them that they're probably not thinking big enough. And I tell them they're probably better than they realize. And I tell them uh, dreams come true. You know, if you want something bad enough, you will achieve it. But you don't have to know. Stay open. You're in the right place. Being in college is the launch pad to the universe. I love that. How about you, Courtney? Yeah. What advice would you give to current students or, or students considering the fine art field? Uh, yeah, a lot like what Kyle was saying. Um, yeah, I'm all, I don't know. They didn't. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like, I kind of pick around, the, I kind of pick around a little bit to see how serious they are. If this is a hobby for you, I'm always like big warning signs. But, <laughs> it, you know, if it's their passion, and you usually can tell right away, if this is their passion, it, it's, I, I try to be very positive and encouraging. It's like, yeah, this is, you're better than you. This is, this is my new pontificate. The, uh, this is like learning another language. If you're not speaking it well, don't, you know, if you took all of a sudden took a foreign language and you think you're going to speak it by the end of the semester, that's that's unrealistic to your brain and how we learn and everything else. This is this is a, a lifelong um, commitment. So drawing one, I'm wanting to see improvement from point A to point B to the end of the semester. But, you know, don't judge yourself too hard. You, you haven't been doing this as long as the teachers around you, that's some of the students that have been drawn. You know, this is a language that takes time to learn. Um, Valencia is very traditional in the way we teach it and we're, you know, there's no magic button where you, you're going to sudden, you're not born with this gift. You earn this gift. So that's my. It's work. Uh, yeah, it's work. That's work. Absolutely. Farron, any quick advice for uh, students <laughs> just starting out? Quick advice. Um, well, I'm not entirely done with my academic journey yet, um, as with Kyle and Courtney. And um, I've probably <laughs> taken on some some battle scars from, you know, both near and far with my choices. But I think I can definitely say that what I did worked in a lot of ways. And it, it did seem like my attitude of just wanting to work really hard and being fully committed to being an artist paid off in many ways. My experience was that a lot of things just kind of fell in line, like just decisions build upon themselves people that you get to know and spend time around end up paying you back later sometimes for the worse sometimes for the better for the most part it was for the better for me um so i guess my advice would just be stay focused and work hard stay focused and work hard i yeah. love it okay so we've got um just a couple rapid fire questions fill in the blank mm -hmm. creativity is imagination Creativity is imagination. Right. Courtney Farron? That's what makes the world go around. Ooh. Your storytelling, yeah. Ooh, storytelling. What motivates you the most? Storytelling. Storytelling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love telling. I mean, that's, yeah, that's kind of like, like what I was finding with the Billy, the, the, the aha moment when I was listening to do a portrait of Billy. And it's like, ah, there's the story. There's the, the hook. That, awesome. That gets me really excited. And we have and about it happens 10, in a second. I have 10 seconds. What is the best or worst advice you ever received regarding your creative field? <laughs> the best oh, wow. and the worst? So best or worst. On. The best just, or just worst. one. We've got... <laughs> the worst advice I was ever given was you can't do that. Oh, okay. The corporations will take care of you, I think. Was the corporations <laughs> will take care of you. <laughs> the best, and I've had a lot of good advice. No, best advice? Oh, best advice. What's your best advice? Anybody? It really was staying in the field and you know, the field is, the creative field is so wide with everything you can do. Why don't you go to school? 
Why don't you go to school? Yeah, that was the best advice I ever got. Oh, that's amazing. So the, the best <laughs> advice, why don't you go to school yeah. and, and diversify, but stay within the creative field? I love yeah, that. All right, guys, I, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much Thank for coming. Um, just a reminder to those who are listening, this, uh, this faculty art show is available through December 8th. It's open from 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. every weekday, Monday through Friday. And uh, we really hope that you get a chance to come out and see it. Our faculty are really, they're, they're just amazing. I, I think you'll be so, so impressed by the work that, that you see there. Um, and, and just like you've heard everybody here say today, uh, one of the reasons I love doing this show is because um, I'm surrounded by amazing artists. I'm surrounded by amazing artists every day, and you get to see the product of just a fraction of that in our Anita Wooten Art Gallery through December 8th. So I hope you're having a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday, and we hope to see you back here in in the spring all right and have a lovely lovely day we'll see you next time